the event this evening. Um, and we will make this available to, uh, to everyone on our Sinister Wisdom page, uh, www.sinisterwisdom.org backslash SW119. It also goes on our YouTube channel, which you can find um, and follow us on. Finally, I want to say that the issue is in the mail to all subscribers, but it's wending its way to everyone very, very slowly. With COVID and the former administration, that feels great to say, our beloved United States Postal Service has had many challenges. I though now have had sightings of the journal out there in the world. I know a number of the international copies were delivered and someone emailed me that her copy arrived in Chicago. Um, so it is getting out there and your copy, if it has not arrived yet, should arrive soon. If you don't have your copy by February 14th, send me an email and I will send you a replacement. Also, there are extra copies available. You can purchase individual copies at sinisterwisdom.org slash SW119, and we will mail those out to you. Media mail is back on track and arriving within 10 to 14 days under most conditions. Please think of friends you have who might like this issue and share it with them. So now on to our program. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of the co-editors of Sinister Wisdom 119, Judith Katz. Judith is the author of two published novels, which I bet the majority of us gathered here this evening have read. Uh, the one is Running Fiercely Towards a High Thin Sound, which won a Lambda Literary Award for Best Lesbian Fiction in 1992, and The Escape Artist, both of which were first published by Firebrand Books in the 1990s and reissued by Bywater Books. The Escape Artist has just been issued in Germany by Dot Books. In 2018, Judith was named with Alana Dykewoman to the Saints and Sinners Hall of Fame. She lives in Minneapolis with her wife, Paula Foreman, and has begun excavating her novel in a drawer, Atomic Age, and assorted other projects. Please join me in welcoming Judith. Judith, you're muted. You're, yeah. ah, can you hear me now? Can, yes, you can. Okay, great, because you're on mute. <laughs> so thanks, Julie, and thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, uh, Julie, you have been tireless. <laughs> you have kept us on track. Um, I also want to thank uh, my publicist, Michelle Carlsberg, whose big idea this was in the first place, and um, to all of the wonderful contributors to this issue. This was truly a real pleasure. Um, especially, I want to thank my dear, dear pal, Alana, who served not only as my editing partner, but also as my mentor. Um, because I had never edited a journal before. And um, she also kept me very well fed and copied up because we met at her home in California because who want, wanted to come here in the winter. I got to go away for the winter and um, on and off. And uh, that was back when we could actually do that. Now we have Zoom to thank. So I'm gonna read first from Letter to the Front, Part 7 by Muriel Ruckheiser, where our journal gets its name from. To be a Jew in the 20th century is to be offered a gift. If you refuse, wishing to be invisible, you choose death of the spirit, the stone insanity. Accepting, take full life, full agonies. Your evening deep in labyrinthine blood of those who resist, fail, and resist, and God reduced to a hostage among hostages. The gift is torment, not alone the still torture, isolation, or torture of the flesh. That may come also, but the accepting wish, the whole and fertile spirit as guarantee for every human freedom, suffering to be free, daring to live for the impossible. As we set out, 
to um, put this journal together, I asked myself, what are Jewish lesbians thinking about now, writing about, making art about here in the first two decades of the 21st century? Do we see ourselves as Jewish dykes, Jewish lesbians, genderqueer Jews? How are we thinking about our Jewish lesbians communities and families, natal and invented? How have our relationships to the states of Israel and Palestine changed over time? How do we reconcile the contradictions between our faith and our politics, our gender and our racial identities? How do we envision our futures and reimagine our past, especially in these fractious and dangerous times? One thing is certain, our commitments to making trouble and speaking up are strong. This project began in March 2018 when my publicist, Michelle Carlsberg, suggested that my old pal Alana and I edit a Jewish lesbian issue of Sinister Wisdom. The task seemed daunting, but I thought, well, maybe I could use it to get out of the house. Um, by that, I mean the house that I had stuck myself into away from art and activism as I recovered from a years long bout with chemo fog. And I'm happy to say that thanks to the work you will find between the pages of this journal, I have emerged. I'm delighted to be making noise and causing trouble again, and to be presenting you with this collection of work by Jewish lesbians now in this second decade of the 21st century. Indeed, this gift. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to my pal, Ilana Dykwoman. Uh, she was an editor of Sinister Wisdom from 1987 to 1994. She's the author of eight books of fiction and poetry, and she's currently writing a play about lesbian love, dementia, right to die, caretaking, and community, honoring her late spouse, Susan Lovenkind. She is grateful for all these years of lesbian interconnection. Here's Alana. Thank you, Judith. I echo Judith's thanks to Michelle Carlsberg for envisioning this issue and getting us to agree to take it on. I treasure Julie's stewardship of Sinister Wisdom, her commitment to lesbians and our literatures. I am glad to my core for the opportunity after all these years to work with Judith for her good judgment, tenacity, and friendship. And the appreciation I have for our contributors is boundless. I want to share the insert we made for this issue, honoring former editor Margot Rivera Weiss of Jewish and Peruvian descent, who was editor of Sinister Wisdom from 1997 to 2000, and who would have been 61 today. The insert is a small selection of her enormous body of art and is another reason to treasure to be a Jewish dyke in the 21st century. And just showing you that this alone is worth the price of admission. <laughs> of course, everything alone is worth the price of admission. Miriam Ruckheiser wrote, to be a Jew in the 20th century is to be offered a gift. In the 21st century, we are compelled to take that gift up again. What's a gift? Everyone in this issue has her own answer. Many are longtime activists who experience Jewish values as goads to action. Most are horrified that the Jews of the Israeli power structures don't appear to share those values, e.g. welcome the stranger as your friend, work for justice for all. It is Jewish to have something to say about being Jewish and to disagree about what that is. Consider that Jews come in all races, that we are Sephardi, Mizrahi, and Ashkenazi. A people is not a religion, or not only a religion, and that's one of the central paradoxes of Judaism. We are a long varied collection of responses to seasonal change. Somewhere in us, we remember when we were shepherds making up poems that became the Song of Songs. What does being a Jewish lesbian mean to me? Always to work with a commitment to intersectional justice. Being a Jew is coming from a people, a particular set of histories 
knowing at least parts of our traditions. This self-knowledge helps us recognize and appreciate the traditions of others and makes it possible to create something new with our inheritances. Being a Jewish lesbian means being attuned to catch a shift in the wind. And damn, but they've been shifting lately. Like beautiful treif snails, we have sensitive twitching antenna that can taste salt in the air. Some of us hide, some of us fight alone, others organize. We are stigmatized, we are often crushed. But here we are again, hiding, fighting, organizing, struggling to survive and to make our survival meld with the survival of every other oppressed and displaced being. Suffering to be free, daring to live for the impossible, as Ruckheiser said. Often I have to remind myself that being visible, that speaking out in whatever ways we can, create possibilities for others we have no idea about. We don't know where our impassioned pleas, our metaphors will take root and change lives. But we know that it happens. So we take the chance. Here, here are many Jewish dykes taking a chance. Find out what happens when you listen. And now it's my pleasure to invite Tova to read from her piece. Tova is a 21st century Jewish lesbian from a working class background. Tova writes, lectures, and takes photographs. She does communication work on equity issues for the University of Oregon. She and her partner, spouse of 33 plus years, live in Eugene, their son, is a professional ballet dancer, so they see lots of shows. Tova. Thank you, Lana. It's very thrilling to be here. Thank you. So this is an excerpt from The Gift Continues. It's hard to know where to begin as a 21st century Jewish dyke. I feel we are becoming nameless again, still, erased from the history of the gay movement, our feminist history of white middle-class bastardization at best, and erased from too many circles of erasure. How do I breathe in the 21st century when anti-Semitism is nameless and named, again, still, 1944, 2019? Two friends were shot in the Pittsburgh synagogue because one overslept. They were late, so they lived. Everything is too close, too hopeless, and too pressing. Full agony, as Rukeyser says. But it's Hanukkah. So I remind myself of the Hanukkah story myth of the second century BCEs and Jews walked into a synagogue of complete ruin, found a drop of oil to light. No one thought it would create light for long, but it lasted eight days, a miracle. Surrounded by runes, someone found something of use, and I suppose that itself is miraculous. So I think about my ancestors in the temple, and I wonder who sat around and said, why not try? And who said, you fool, what's the point? And who complained this is entirely too much trouble? And who decided to dream of hope? Who was the dyke in the synagogue of runes, and what did it mean to be a Jewish dyke in the second century BCE? In the end, so the story goes, it turned out okay for those Jews, but how will it be for us? Where is our ability to have faith in a little light in a world of increasing room? Do we dare to light something, anything? And where were the Jewish working class dykes in the 20th century? Dykes I knew in the 20th century thought dyke fashion was wearing the same clothes my father wore for work and I didn't know how to react, I wanted to fit in, but wearing my father's sweat-soaked work clothes couldn't be kosher, could it? Now my clothes are anything that doesn't make me gag in quote women's sizes or gifts from fat dykes and I can't tell who are the 21st century dykes. Dyke chic, ripped off in style again, it's all the rage, rage. 
Some days I'm just too exhausted to even feel the rage that tore me apart in my youth, cuts and scars of rage haunt me from one century to the next, but they feed me too. They feed and starve at once. I'm a fat, starved Jewish working class dyke in the 21st century. Will I starve or live off my own scarred flesh? We have to learn to feed ourselves. As a child, when my working class family was able to join a synagogue, we sat in the last row. Some could only afford to stand in the back and some were outside listening through the doors. And when I attend services now, I sit in the back, paying homage to my childhood as messed up as it was to family and ancestors, poor and working class, Jewish dykes of the second to the 21st century, Jews of color with disabilities, immigrants, all who gather in the back, in the doorways, outside and on the streets. I sit in the back and I read mostly under the line. Above is liturgy, but below there's this soft underbelly of stories and midrash. And at L'cha Dodi, when we stand and all turn to the back of the sanctuary, there below the line explains a Yiddish expression that when the entire congregation turns its back, inviting the Shabbos queen to come in peace. It is the poor and the shy and the stranger in the back rows who are given the honor of welcoming her first. So the 21st century Jewish dyke in the back who's often exhausted and filled with rage and age welcome Shabbat first. We get to rest, we get the gift. And I sit in the back to receive Ru Kaiser's gift full force. I'm comforted there with spirits of ancestors in the back, the solitude feeds me. It reminds me of quiet courage, how the others dared to live for the impossible. It is them I need to be with. Together we weep and hold it onto history and rage and cracks that lit in the light. And the spirits of those who have passed, there are so many more each day and they are here. And those that remain are corporeal bodies in temples of rune look for light. Let us now enter the back of the temples of rune to look for the light. Second century BCE, 1944, 2019 to be a 21st century Jewish dyke is to enter houses and sanctuaries and cities of rune. Maybe we enter slowly, feebly exhausted, enraged, or even in deep despair, but we enter still looking for light, any light. You never know if there may be a miracle. Okay, maybe not a miracle, but a gift. To be a 21st century Jewish dyke is to accept the whole and fertile spirit as guarantee, daring to live for the impossible. Do we dare to live for the impossible? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tova. Um, all right, so now um, I am pleased, very pleased to introduce you to Mira Schlossberg, um, whose work I find delightful. Um, she is a writer, comic artist, and editor whose work focuses on queer experiences, um, Jewish mysticism, and eco-theology. Her new graphic novella, Kugel Western, is forthcoming from Glum Press in 2021. Uh, you can find her on Twitter. I think uh, that will be coming up at Mira Schlossberg. So here she is, Mira Schlossberg. Thanks so much. Um, this piece is called Lash and Koidish. You can tell all the saints are gay or else why would they hold their fingers up the way they do? Saint Sebastian is one of the gayest saints in terms of iconography and fan base. He's always tied up with arrows sticking out of him, looking up to God very sensuously and wearing only a small cloth draped around his waist. One of the earliest gay cults is dedicated to him. Saint Sebastian was martyred twice. Irene saved him from dying from the arrow wounds, but he was clubbed to death almost immediately afterwards. I like praying to saints when you need to ask for something specific. Dear Anthony, please bring back my lost cat. Dear Sebastian, please make me a dreamy hunk like you. Call on my Jewish side when I'm feeling thankful for something. 
A holy person is one who says 100 blessings every day. So you have to be on the lookout for reasons to give thanks all the time. Baruchat Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Oseh Maseh Vereshit, for seeing natural wonders like lightning or the ocean. Nectar bats have tongues three times the length of their bodies. Their tongues are covered in tiny papilla, and when the bat sticks its tongue into a flower, the papilla fill with blood and become erect, and this helps the bat hold the maximum amount of nectar when it retracts its tongue. Baruchat Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Meshane Habriot, for very strange creatures. After five years of soft crushing, I finally have sex with a straight friend of mine. The inside of her duvet cover is patterned with what looks like multicolored confetti, as if God knew this was going to happen and provided some celebratory imagery to match. I tell her I've never been with another Jewish person before. So how was it? Comforting? It is kind of. How was it sleeping with not a man? More delicate, softer. She strokes my back very lightly with the tips of her fingers. In the morning, she opens the drawer of her bedside table and shows me a laminated prayer that her grandmother gave her. Hebrew letters are familiar to me, but I can't read them at all. She tells me how she used to keep her vibrator in the drawer with the prayer, but it didn't seem right to keep them together. I tell her about my opinion that sex is holy, being present in your body and being connected and all that. Do you know it's a mitzvah to have sex on Shabbat? She says she never thought of it that way before. We fuck again and while we're fucking, she says far out and then she says, thank God. In Yiddish class, the teacher tells us the name for words that come straight from Hebrew and Aramaic is Lashem Koidish, which means holy tongue. Reading Yiddish is almost the same as reading Hebrew, except Yiddish has vowels. I stare at a handwriting worksheet, trace the letters so slowly with my pen like a child, repeat the sounds under my breath. It feels good to learn these things and bad to not already have known them. For 24 hours after the first time, I feel fine. The moon shines in the daytime. The trees under the moon are huge and green. When the 24 hours is over, I start having visions of her in white lace under a chuppah, my dirty scuffed boots next to her shiny black ones with the sensible, te sensible heel, homo normativity, holy tongue tricks from the Torah. Her house is quiet and cold. She turns the electric blanket on and we have sex wearing novelty socks. Thanks. <laughs> oh, she's so sweet. Oh. Thank you, Mira. Um, it's my pleasure to now introduce to, to now introduce Amy Horowitz. Amy Horowitz worked as Sweet Honey in the Rocks artist representative, won a Grammy, co-founded Roadwork and Sister Fire, and teaches and writes about Jerusalem, Mizrahi culture, and music in disputed territory. She is Israel Studies Senior Fellow at Indiana University and works with Navajo Technical University. You can find her at emmyhorowitz.org. Amy. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes. I speak to you from Manahawk lands, the original and current caretakers of Alexandria, Virginia on the birthday of Dr. Angelus Davis. Reading from section of my essay, let's not eat ourselves alive. In her 1983 essay, Coalition Politics Turning the Century, Bernice Johnson Regan asks, if coalition is so necessary, why is it so uncomfortable? One answer is that coalition is by definition uncomfortable because it presupposes meeting across difference. Sustaining coalition is hard because we find it easier to share our own hurt than to recognize the hurt in others. To build coalitions that can overtake the deep history of racial and economic injustice and greed requires this recognition. My essay is a stitching together of unpublished Facebook posts in which I wrangle with the limits of coalition work as brought into uneasy relief in the fall of 2018. As a growing chorus on the right and the left voiced opposition to Tamika Mallory, Linda Sarsour and Angela Davis. It's a collection of odds and ends and cautionary tales, but spoiler alert, the simming to boiling stock at stake, the elephant occupying space in the co coalition room is the cost of supporting Palestine. My crock pot started simmering on November 19th, 2018, when I read a Facebook post by the self-proclaimed Women's March founder, Teresa Shuk, and saw that Jewish lesbians 
two of my identities were among her supporters in calling for Women's March co-chairs, Mallory and Sarsour to step down. The Tempest was Tamika Mallory's stance on Louis Farrakhan. While Mallory denounced anti-Semitism and distanced herself from Farrakhan's positions, she refused to apologize for calling him goat, greatest of all time. Linda Sarsour, a Palestinian American Muslim anti-Israeli occupation activist who herself was experiencing ongoing hateful attacks, stood by her. The stock thickened in December with the announcement that the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute had rescinded its human rights award to Dr. Angela Davis, a supporter of Palestinian rights, claiming that she does not meet all the criteria for the award. It left me wondering, is there a recipe for coalition across difference and anger, disappointment and transgression? What will it take to build coalitions with those who hold some positions that feel dangerous, even as they themselves hold little power and are endangered? In my essay, I discuss my engagement with Palestine and Israel and analyze the patchwork of odds and ends through the ideas of coalition, asymmetry, and disputed territory. I've been wading in the waters of Israel-Palestine for 50 years. During half a century, I've enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner in Ramallah, shaken hands with Abba Ibn and Golda Meir, felt shaken by a Jerusalem bus explosion, been tear gassed at a women's march as we linked hands around the old city and lived with a Bedouin family in Nueva. I founded the Living Jerusalem Project and I write about the music of Israeli Jews from Islamic lands. I'm speaking to you from my multivocal, always evolving self, where all my identities co-inhabit, co-inform, and co-resist. Being in coalition requires recipes to survive the hurt we cause each other and ourselves. It demands finding comfort with discomfort, whether it means being called out on racist behavior, confronting asymmetries of class, education, and generation, or confronting asymmetries of power that may be hiding behind imaginary symmetries like those within coalitions of US Jews and Palestinians. When you're in coalition with someone, communication across race, class, and religion is always asymmetrical and co-resistance is always called for. These principles can be a service as we wrestle across racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. The enemies of justice are loud and powerful. To defeat them, we need the strength and power of all of us, even those with whom we strenuously disagree. I am grateful to be in coalition with these women. We have to turn the heat down from boil to simmer in our coalition crock pot. White supremacists laugh as we assist them in destroying our coalition. Let's keep overturning their overturn. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Irina Klepfitz, um, whose work on the tribe of Dina and many other um, publications and activists' uh, causes has uh, made this issue possible. Irina Klepfitz is a poet, teacher, Yiddish translator, researcher of Yiddish women writers and intellectuals, and a lesbian feminist activist. A bilingual edition of her collected poems with some prose will be published in Poland in 2021. She recently completed a new collection of poetry tentatively titled Her Birth and Later Years, Poems 1990 through 2020. Please welcome Irina. Thank you, Ilana, and thank you, Judith, and thank you, Julie, for making this possible. The name of this poem that I'm going to read is called <laughs> Der Fremde in der Fremd. Gedenkst, do you remember when you were a stranger among strangers? A Fremde on Papieren, 
a stranger without papers. Gedenkst die Frages, those endless questions, wer seid ihr, von wann kommt ihr, who are you, where are you from, why are you here and not there? Wer seinen gewen eure Schreinen, who were your neighbors, where was the school, what work did you do, what can you do here that you couldn't do there? Noch einmal, for the third, fourth, fifth time. Wer seid ihr? Von wann kommt ihr? Who are you? Where are you from? Why are you here? And not there. Wer ist der Mann? Wer ist die Frau? Who is this man? Who is this woman? Und die Papieren and their papers und das Kind and this child. Did you find it here? Or bring it from there? Do you have a passport for him, for her, for ein Kind, that one with the dark hair? Noch einmal for the 10th, 11th, 12th time. <clears throat> Wer seid ihr? Von wann kommt ihr? Who are you? Where are you from? Why are you here and not there? Who do you know here? And who did you know there? Where will you sleep here? How did you sleep there? When eure Halimus, what do you dream of here? What did you dream of there? Where will you work here? What work did you do there? And why can't you just work there? Wo is the visa, the green card, the passport, visa, green card, passport, photo from here and from there? And why did you cut your hair? And the skin, and why did you bring this child here and not just leave it there? Noch einmal, for the 18th, 19th, 20th time. Wer seid ihr? Von wann kommt ihr? Für was seid ihr da und nicht geblieben dort? Why are you here? I, why didn't you just stay there? Thank you. Um, and next up is Dr. Yael Mishali. I had the pleasure of working with her over a number of months. Um, and I think her piece is just terrific. Dr. Yael Mishali is a feminist queer writer, activist, and performer. She's a gender studies lecturer in both Tel Aviv University and Ben Gurion University of the Negev as well as a member of the organizing committee of the largest Israeli conference devoted to LGBT studies and queer theory and other sex. Please welcome Dr. Yael Mishali. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure working with you. You Must Love Me was the first Mizrahi song I listened to on my own. The first time I let myself listen to a Mizrahi song repeatedly was while working on a drag show. On stage, I was as Mizrahi as I could be in dress, movement, and voice before I was ready to do so in real life. Through a song that presents a Mizrahi woman to whom it is clear that there is no man who can resist her, I wanted to make a double passing from someone who looks like a straight Ashkenazi woman to the Mizrahi femme that I am, who by perfectly imitating the language of women who preceded her entices imagined butches. Only after the performance, when there was no longer reason to memorize the song and I could still hear it playing in my head, could I admit it aroused in me what I thought I had willingly suppressed. My mother always wished we would get our hair straightened. Ever since I was a little girl, my mother, who was fascinated by the beauty of women with straight hair, would tell me that our hair was a calamity. When I came out of the closet at the age of 16, I cut my hair short, interwining ethnic and sexual stereotypes. Lesbians have short hair and Moroccans have hair like steel wool. The first time I wore my hair down, was 10 years later as a femme lesbian. 
what place is reserved for Mizrahi women in the Western white male queer identity? Can queer identity be Mizrahi? For me, being Mizrahi suggests maintaining a connection to my family. I find it hard to believe that a queer approach to identity can explain my choices to my parents. Can I tell them I am sacrificing everything they consider sacred for an ambiguous, fluid, non-identity? And if I do so, wouldn't it sound like an answer to the prayers that there may still hope that I'll soon want a husband and children? In the house where my mother grew up, there was a small basin by the door in which the girls were supposed to wash their older brother's feet. Your sister took on this role and when it was their turn, they would carry out the task silently or while softly humming or by swallowing what has once been pride. But when it was your turn, you said no. At that time and place, it didn't sound that way. Sometimes it sounded like a basin overturning and water spilling and furious shouting in Moroccan. Sometimes it sounded like hurried footsteps and a door slamming. Sometimes it sounded like threats and blow. Sometimes it sounded warm, like crying. When Israeli feminism emerged, much like its American counterpart, it assumed that racial or ethnic tensions were ir irrelevant to the feminist struggle and even jeopardized female unity and solidarity. As a result, Mizrahi women found themselves trapped be between their familial obligations and the feminist call for celebrating sexuality and gaining control over the body. The Ashkenazi feminist position created a double binary between the modern Western world, allegedly open to the advancement of all women, and the traditional Mizrahi world, which imprisons its women. My mother used to say, don't bring a Moroccan man home. Moroccans are primitive and don't know how to treat women, and your, your father is no example. You should find an Ashkenazi who is set. He'll listen to you more. Is my pull towards Ashkenazi butchers and empty interrealizations of my mother's dream? The feminist critique of any practices involving power relations as patriarchal and sexist appeared not only in Israel in regards to the Mizrahi lifestyle, but also in regards to lesbian subcultures like uh, Butch Femme and SM. This criticism of marginal sexual patterns veiled a racist and homophobic premise, assuming all women could and should obey the same predetermined principles in order to be considered feminists. My mother told me, hurry up, Yael, be, before you'll miss your chance. Maybe that's why even after finishing my doctoral studies at the age of 30, I still felt like I was behind, wasting time. Your mother taught you how to keep calm and I can see in your eyes her smile encouraging you for what you have already achieved, proud of whom you are becoming. My mother taught me to accomplish as much as possible. Your mother taught you to accept things as they are. My mother taught me how to change them so they would fit me. My identification as a femme is linked to my past and family, just as the butch femme culture is linked to the class from which it derived, the working class, which was largely populated by ethnic and racial minorities. Being a Mizrahi feminist being, means for me preserving my mother's feminism, showing that it isn't considered feminist only because it took place within the confines of home. Being a Mizrahi woman is a queer process because it forces me to deconstruct the context in which my identity was formed and reformed, as well as the conditions that allowed it to appear or prevented it from being acknowledged. A daydream. A woman is cooking on a steamy afternoon. Her armpits are moist and her cheeks are rosy. A Mizrahi song is playing in the background. The floor is wet from expectation like her body and the amount of light is precise like a spice. Her face is my mother's face and I can almost hear one of my brothers crying and crib in the next room. But, but you come from behind, hug me, strong like the men my mother always wanted behind me. And in front of me, the food reaches a boiling point 
and I'm bubbling and you cannot let me cool off. And I'm fixing you a plate of desire, but we eat from the pot standing up, steam stream alongside our bodies. You take me and bring me back, reminding me that it's me and all of this under the floral apron. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. I have to cool off for a minute here. So um, I'm next going to introduce R.D. Landau. And um, R.D. is the editorial assistant for the Jewish News of Northern California. Her work has appeared in Diabolical Plots, Entropy, and Star 82 Review. R.D. I think. I wrote this poem um, when I went to a lesbian wedding shortly after Trump got elected um, in order to reflect on the contrast between that and the horrible things happening in the larger world. Um, as time went on, Trump's election started to feel a little less relevant, but I was thinking about it and there are so many mass shootings that mass shootings are literally always relevant. Um, so this poem is now called After the Shooting, I Come Home for a Lesbian Wedding. We're living in a dystopia, but I'm happy my daughter is here, says my mother at the after party. Her socialist mother-in-law taught her it could always get worse. So grim, I say, but my mother shakes her head. Nah, Jewish optimism. I say Andrew Jackson, you say McCarthy. They say, America was always like this. High time you people noticed. Thank you, R.D. Thank you. So next we have um, Ellen Rifkin. She uh, lives in Eugene, Oregon, where she leads Yiddish Winkle and is active in her local chapter of showing up for racial justice. She says, friends, forest, music, and meditation sustain her. Ellen. This piece is called Notes from Israel, Palestine. Earlier in this piece I'm about to read from, I describe a day spent with longtime Israeli feminist activist, Hannah Safran, who took me and a friend of hers from the Haifa Women's Center on one of her weekly visits to the Jordan Valley prior to COVID, when she was bringing supplies and moral support to Palestinian shepherd families, increasingly robbed of their lands and livelihood by Jewish settlers and the IDF. Hannah, Marav, and I argue intensely on the ride back to Haifa. Hannah sees a straight line of displacement of Palestinian farmers, villagers, and city people extending from the very beginnings of Zionist settlement to the present. She names the whole process as settler colonialism, while I want to reserve that term for the post-67 settlements. Doesn't it matter that Zionism was a liberation movement that arose in the context of oppression? Unlike colonialists, weren't we returning to a historical homeland? Hannah is adamant about confronting past injustice she refers me to a book about an early Zionist pioneer, Zosha, who died during World War II as part of an anti-fascist spy ring in Europe. Months after my return home, I locate codenamed Zosha by Yehudi Kafri. Zosha Poznanska trained with her youth movement in Polish forests and clandestine meeting places before making her way to Palestine in the 1920s. Within weeks of arriving, she learns that Arab peasants had been displaced for the sake of the kibbutz she and her comrades are building. Well-versed in socialist analysis, she is shocked that her movement bought land from absentee Arab landowners, probably in Beirut, evicting the fellahin, the peasants who actually worked the land. It wasn't even theirs to sell, Zosha's biographer imagines her thinking, and if it had been theirs, they wouldn't have sold it. Zosha is devastated and seeks out the Communist Party in Jerusalem, later returning to Europe to flee arrest under British mandate law. Nowadays, the Jewish National Fund doesn't need to buy Palestinian land, but Selim, Israel's award-winning human rights group, explains how the implicit threat of state violence undergirds the government's myriad pretexts for appropriation. 
Once in a great while, the Supreme Court strikes down these pretexts, but confiscations are so routine that B'Tselem's website offers an interactive map, continually updated, where clicking on your choice of icons yields, quote, further information about communities facing the risk of expulsion, unquote. The expulsions proliferate only because a whole population is dismissed as terrorists, or at best perceived as lacking the same attachment to their home on the earth that Israeli Jews experience. Almost 100 years ago, Zosha saw what most of her comrades did not, the full humanity of her Arab neighbors. Whereas early Zionists by and large perceived the Fellaheen as primitive, when passing by their homes, Zosha saw skillfully tended crops she saw parents caring for their children. Their losses and dreams were as resonant for her as the sufferings and aspirations of her own people. Zosha's biographer, Kafri, combines meticulous research with empathy for her subject and asks us to look at the world through Zosha's eyes. But the author doesn't deny her own lived experience. Because of her father's Zionist work, Caffrey grew up in Palestine and survived the Shoah. She was seven years old in the children's house of a kibbutz not far from Zosha's kibbutz when Zosha com committed suicide in a Gestapo prison cell after months of torture, taking her spy ring's code word to her death. I don't believe that Jewish suffering, the Jewish suffering justifies another people's sufferings. Like Caffrey, I just want us to start telling whole stories, not parts of the truth. In the bleakness and violence of present events, and where it's not Americans' place to prescribe solutions, it is helpful to support and publicize the work of Palestinians and Jews who cannot live with only part of a story shut down to the other. We can follow B'Tselem's updates and support organizations like the Bereaved Families Forum, Tiger, Al-Haq, and more. We can amplify the voices of Palestinian resistance leaders who acknowledge that Jews too are tied to the land and of their Jewish counterparts driven to build solidarity with people whose humanity their government denies. Refusing to not see, they are the ones forging the trust that will make any shared future possible. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you very much. So our um, final reader uh, for the evening, and then I think um, after Bonnie reads, I think um, Julie's gonna open it up for a conversation. But um, our final reader is Bonnie Kaplan, Bonnie S. Kaplan. She's a Pushcart nominated poet and educator whose work appears in numerous journals and anthologies, including Adrian Rich, a tribute anthology. Her poem, Mastectomy Simple, is a finalist for the Marsha and Jan Bilchek Prize for Poetry at Bellevue Literary Review. She lives Sorry. and works. She lives and works in Los Angeles. Bonnie. Thank you, Judith, and thank you, Ilana. Thank you, Sinister Wisdom and Julie. My poem is dedicated to Rabbi Lisa Edwards. She is the Rabbi Emeritus of Beth Chaim Hadashim in Los Angeles, and she's actually in Sinister Wisdom 119. A Manzanita Yod. I once whittled a yod from a fallen twig of the manzanita bush, only I didn't think it yod at the time. As with most whittling, I did not know where I was headed. One end of the sprig was forked evidence of branching. And on the other, I carved a single claw, a talon really, which tipped it into the magical, a sorcerer's stick. Manzanita has a natural patina as it grows in nature and needs little polishing. Yet I sat for many hours burnishing with a stone, adding my own wear and shine to an already tough and ruddy grain. Torah and Hebrew were the farthest thing from my mind that day in the forest. Yet something sacred was afoot. I thought 
my twig a bird's perch, a decorative fetish, not a Jewish ritual pointer. But that is so like Judaism, to prepare you in ways dictated by a mystery, whispering, hold on, you will need this one day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for reading. Um, thank you again to Alana and Judith. Um, there's multiple ways that folks are welcome to engage in this portion of our program. We have about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I'm seeing lots of stuff pass really fast in the chat. I'm not quite able to read it all. I think much of the chat um, for our readers has been praised for your wonderful pieces. Um, so thank you. You'll want to look at the chat um, when you get a moment. Um, and then uh, also you can raise your hand. I see one person with their hand raised uh, right now. So Laurel, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can start off our conversation. Laurel, you're still muted. There you go. I accidentally raised my hand, but I really enjoyed Bonnie's uh, poem and um, it meant a lot to me to hear her read. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. Thank you, Laurel. And where are you joining us from this evening? Woodland Hills. Woodland Hills. Thanks, Thanks. For, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Folks who haven't been watching, we had between 260 and 270 people all so that's been really wonderful. Um, and I guess I'll start out and ask um, um, Alana and Judith if you might share with us some, uh, some surprising, wonderful thing that happened in the process of editing the journal. Well, I'll, I can start. I, I just very much remember at one point I mean, one of the things that was wonderful about putting this together was seeing familiar names or names of people whose work I had been hearing about but didn't really know. But there was a, a morning over uh, breakfast where I looked at Alana and I said, do you think that we're too old to be editing this issue? Not, not because of the people um, necessarily like the, the <laughs> folks who I know, but um, the work of the younger writers like R.D. and like um, like Mira, which I wasn't always sure I understood. <laughs> I understood what they were getting at or trying to say, and there were some terms I, I hadn't ever heard before being stuck here in Minneapolis, and Alana had to explain them to me because she's hipper from um, Oakland and like that. So and and also just the pleasure of getting to work with somebody that I have known for a really long time hadn't connected with for a while and then reconnected with at Saints and Sinners. Um, it was a real pleasure because, you know, a lot, I lived in the same house with Alana while she was writing her first book. Um, and um, we've known each other through a lot of creative life. And it was just really a wonderful experience to bring together all of these voices and to make sure that it was and, and also just can I just say again what I said during our rehearsal last week it's such a pleasure to meet every meet everybody and um hear your actual speaking voices now Alani you have to talk oh no well the biggest surprise was that we had agreed to do this when we were <laughs> probably under the influence of some kind of New Orleans drink concoction. And I had no memory of it until Michelle Carlsberg wrote me and said, or you wrote me and said, well, what do you think about doing this issue you agreed to do? And I was like, what? What is, <laughs> what did I agree to do? Anyway, I am so glad that I agreed to do it. Whoever's idea it was to start with. And um, working with Judith for me too has just been, one of those great pleasures where, you know, I've, I, I've experienced a lot of deaths of my friends and, and family in the last years. And, and often when somebody that I know or knew or 
always wanted to make a connection with has passed, I think, gee, I'll never get to do this great idea I had to do with them. And one of the great things about working with Judith was we had this great idea and we got to do it um, before we died. So, so I was, uh, that was just like a delight to me. And I, I am so happy for the connection and for the work and for being, um, for continuing to be part of lesbian and Jewish community in these ways. So. Right. And, and as I said, this, project brought me back into that community because um, from from the minute that Trump was elected, I was still physically unable to go out and yell or participate. And I've only even just started writing again over the past couple of months. It, so this was a way for me to engage as a writer, but with other writers. And also I think Alana, and I have slightly different aesthetics. And I think that it, as this reading shows, it worked, it, it worked really well together. And you all were great. All of you, the contributors who are out in the ether too, who you didn't get to see, and some of the work that you did get to see in the slideshow. So wonderful, wonderful, um, I, I think combination of, of what we're all kind of thinking about and working toward right now. Um, I, I have somebody raising their hand. I'm also going to pose for people to think about Evelyn Beck, um, who is with us this evening and I think is still with us. Posted thank right you. At the right, thank you to Evelyn. Um, she posted right at the beginning. Wow, amazing to see this and how far um, things have come since she edited, of course, Nice Jewish Girls in. Um, and that was published in 1982. So it was coming together in the late 70s and the early 80s. So I pose a question um, to you all about what, what kinds of changes do you see happening and what kinds of things are, are staying the same that you really value and, and feel important to you. Um, and I see that um, Evie Beck has unmuted herself. I wonder if she wants to say something and then someone had their hand raised who I lost track of. If you wanna raise again, um, please do. But Evie, do you want to say a few words to us? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, this is a totally thrilling event. And one of the questions that I've been on my mind in the last several years is it like the work we did in about anti-Semitism and seems like all of the issues about Jewish relationships to Palestinians, to, to race, like this more salient now, even than they were in 1982. And I didn't find that aspect uplifting. I'm thrilled that now <laughs> it is being looked at again from a vantage point of a multi-generational group. I think that's really thrilling to me. And to find my old, the old folks who were there in 82, many are still with us, are here right on this. And some have passed and I wanna honor those like Melanie, like Adrienne who are gone and others who just aren't here anymore. So very moving moment and thank you for doing this. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you came to this. It's very important. Oh, I, I wouldn't miss it. And yeah. I'd be at Irina's too. <laughs> yeah. And lots of folks are talking about how much nice Jewish girls meant to them in the chat. Um, let's see. And I saw that it was Jeb raising her hand um, to speak and flashed on my screen and then disappeared. But maybe Jeb, you're unmuted. Would you like to say something? Yes, I would, besides saying what a wonderful evening it has been and what a joy to see the faces. I wanted to say that as a minor contributor to this issue, I wanted to thank Judith and Alana because it was a joy to work with them. They were great to work with. And I think everybody should know that from a contributor's point of view, it was uh, a wonderful experience. Thanks, Jeb. 
And has your issue arrived in Washington, D.C.? No, not yet. Okay, I was, I was so hopeful for a moment there. Other reflections? Do any of our readers want Joan to share? Joan has her hand up. Joan Don't. has her hand up. Yep. Joan, unmute. See, is I, this what it's like when I, people I are just... This is exactly what it's like when you're teaching. Yes. I, I just want to say, I was moved from the first sound, from the first image. And you know, I come with all kinds of battles inside me and I realize how Jewish that is. I want to thank the editors so much for doing, including all the hard stuff. That's the real gift to me that we can't take easy generalizations ever, not in the 80s, not in the 90s, and not now. And so I came defended, and I just thank you so much for all the courages and, and open-heartedness you obviously have from the readers. So that's all. I just wanted to say thank you. Well, Joan, I want to thank you because you posted on Facebook yourself dancing after the inauguration. And that was like probably the truest pleasure of that whole day for me was watching you just shaking away in a very Jewish way and taking, you know, having pleasure and joy from that. And actually that's, you're kind of a marker of pleasure and joy for me too in the middle of the struggle. So thank you. That's great. Yeva has a question. Yeva, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Julie. I, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm really delighted that uh, Margo was honored today. Uh, Margo was a, a, a recent colleague of mine in arts. But um, but I my question really for the editors is, that, so one, I did things the wrong way and submitted uh, a long time ago, probably right after you all agreed to do this thing. Um, so I want to know, because um, I think it's too much to, to, to be an 82 and maybe 90, like these various classic texts. There are a lot of, there are Jewish lesbians who are not in this issue. I can't wait to get mine. It didn't come yet. I can't wait. It's going to be like my, you know, whatever. I'm going to be reading it over and over and over again. But what about um, thinking about um, people, le Jewish lesbians born yesterday, Jewish lesbians born 10 years ago, Jewish lesbians who are turning 18, to keep thinking, like it's, it keeps going, it shouldn't just be like so. So anyway, do you, have you guys thought about that? And when will the next one be? Because then I will- <laughs> You know, uh, go ahead, you answer, Alana. <laughs> well, I hope there will be a next one. I mean, there's now there are three volumes, Nice Jewish Girls, Tribe of Dina and this one. And I hope we'll fill a whole shelf, like an encyclopedia of the old days, um, uh, uh, you know, with each generation and, and generations in between um, contributing. There's so, there's so much more work out there and so many more um, Jews. I, was, I, I know there are many other Jewish lesbians of color and I wish that more of them had sent us work um, and or that we knew more to ask. Um, we did ask some women who, who didn't contribute. Um, so we could have a whole issue that was just Jewish lesbians of color. Um, we could have many, many kinds of, of these issues and I hope other people will just take this work up and do it. Right, and I do want to say that Michelle Carlsberg has a bunch of ideas about what we should be doing next, per usual. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's, there is much more, and what we weren't able to put in this issue too. There was, you know, we had a certain number of pages, and then we pushed that, and there, there's more. I know there's a lot more to say. Yeah, Joan. I just want to say 
can I say just congratulations, Judith? You look fabulous, Dolly. You look great. I love great. this. I love this. Uh, congratulations, Alana. Thank you to all the contributors. Oh, my God. They did not agree to do this at all. It was 2019. We were in New Orleans. Judith said, oh, you know, I'd like to do this. And then I said, oh, what would you like to do? And Alana was like, I'm really busy. I'm really busy. I got a lot of projects going on. So they really didn't agree. <laughs> but I called Julie anyway. And I said, what do you think about this? She said, I'm in. I said, guess what you are doing? I said, it's 2021. It's only 2019. You can do it. And you did it. And congratulations. And thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone that is here tonight. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful evening. And Joan Nessel, hey, and Carol CJ, I'm seeing some folks from back in the day. I love it. <laughs> so perfect. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give us our final announcements. Um, set your set your screens to the gallery view. We have a great outro song for us to all dance to. You can scroll by. There's 10 pages of folks. Everybody who wants to should turn there their video on so you can see and wave and chat with people. I just have a couple announcements. The video will be made available tomorrow at the Sinister Wisdom website, um, so, uh, sinisterwisdom.org slash SW119. Also, I put it in the chat, but I invite everybody to join us in a month for our tribute to Irina Klepfish um, in conversation with Rachel Levitsky. That will be on Tuesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. Irina will read new work. She'll talk to Rachel about her overall body of work. It's going to be a stunning evening. We're planning events all through June. They're available at sinisterwisdom.org slash events. And for our final song, which I'm going to try and load on here right now, um, we are going to hear um, music from Alicia Spiegel's designed to get everyone up and dancing. Alicia is the world's leading klezmer fiddler and founder of the Grammy, and I shared the wrong thing, and founder of the Grammy winning Cosmetics. Um, give me one moment while I get the right thing queued up. Grammy winning Cosmetics, which she co-led for 17 years. Um, as you listen to the music, everyone is invited to stand up, dance. I'll highlight videos of people um, dancing or my colleagues, Juno and, um, uh, Casey will do that. And when the music ends, we will end the call. Please join us again. We have lots of great stuff coming up February, March, April, May, and June. We look forward to seeing you again. Here we have Alicia Spiegel's. Mm -hmm.